It's now my pleasure to introduce our commencement speaker, John Jones. John is the co-founder and CEO of Brighton Jones, Washington State's largest registered investment advisor and one of the nation's fastest growing wealth management firms. At its core, Brighton Jones is driven by a desire to help its clients, colleagues and community members live richer lives that extend far beyond financial well-being. Headquartered in Seattle, the firm now has offices in Portland, San Francisco, Scottsdale and Washington DC. John and his 165 teammates truly enjoy re redefining what it means to advise individuals and families at the intersection of life and wealth. Brighton Jones has appeared on Seattle Business Magazine's 100 Best Companies to Work For, 10 years running, and was named a top corporate phil philanthropist by the Puget Sound Business Journal. John was born and raised in East, East Wenatchee and wears his Washington State pride like a badge of honor. He graduated in 93 with a BA in finance and accounting and was part of the honors program as it was then and a member of the Theta Chi fraternity. John's wife Gretchen, also a coup, graduated from the College of Pharmacy in 1994. And I'm very proud to say their son David will start his freshman year in the Honours College this fall. And their oldest daughter Molly, a high school junior, also has her eyes set on Pullman. And their two youngest children, Maggie and Vivian, hopefully will be on the college hunt soon and also part of a generation in the Honours College. John. Thank you, Dean. Good evening. Well, thank you to all the faculty at the Honors College for inviting me to speak today. And welcome to all the friends and family members of the graduates. And a huge congratulations to the 2018 class of Washington State University's Honors College. So college graduation is a huge, huge deal. You spent the majority of your life in a classroom, studying for tests, listening to lectures, writing papers, and today you're graduating from WSU. So again, congratulations. So now, some of you will go on to get graduate degrees, and others will launch into their professional careers. But all of you will have one thing in common. You'll all be Cougar alumni. <laughs> However, before you can actually graduate, there's one last test you have to take. And I happen to be accredited teacher of this test. And it's very simple. Wherever you go, and if you walk by somebody wearing a WSU Cougar logo, you've got a job. And the job is to raise your hand up yeah. and say, go Cougs. Yeah. Exactly. OK, so we're going to do this tonight. And we're going to need a lot of participation. So when you see the logo up, it's already happening. When you see the logo up, I want to hear everybody say, go Cougs. Are okay, we ready? Here we go. You're awesome. Okay. Well, let's do it one more time. I want people to hear us down at Beasley Coliseum. All right. Here we go. Perfect. So, be on your toes. You may see that a few more times. It's really important that our graduates learn how to be professional Cougar alumni. So my company's mission statement is to help its clients and teammates live a richer life. I hear giggling about my, my dog Stitch there. He's our chief compassion officer. <clears throat> and when we say live a richer life, we mean being happy. And my hope tonight is that we can share a little bit about what we've learned about the art and the science of being happy. It's the one thing we can all agree on in this room, I would guess, 
is that we all want to be happy in life. And 25 years ago today, I was sitting out there in our graduate seats. And there's two things that I remember. One thing for sure is that I have no idea who spoke at this commencement speech, <laughs> which doesn't bode well for my speech tonight. But the second thing that I remember is that, we, that I thought money was a primary driver of happiness. And as it turns out, in a recent survey of millennials, that things haven't changed much. 80% also agreed that money was a driver of happiness. Now, I've worked with wealthy individuals for the last 25 years around their life planning. And I've concluded with certainty that there is no correlation between being happy and having a lot of money. So if money doesn't make us happy, what is it? Well, I wish I had the answer. Especially I wish I had the answer when I was sitting in your seats 25 years ago. But it reminds me of a story from John Lennon. And it goes something like this, that when he was five years old, his mother said to him, the key to happiness, or the key to life was happiness. And so then when he went off to school, the teacher said, well, what do you want to be when you grow up? And he wrote down one word, happy. And she said, I'm sorry, John, I don't think you understand the, the lesson. And he said, I'm sorry, I don't think you understand life. <laughs> so let me share with you the way I think about life. So it's a little simple, but it's a seesaw or a teeter-totter. And all of life events tend to hit this, this plateau. And there are very few things in life that are on the extremes that are very hard to manage your emotions around. But there are a few. So there are things like graduation, extremely happy. Getting married. The birth of a child, extremely happy. And of course, Coogs winning an apple cup. <laughs> okay, we ready? Here we go. Go Coogs. Exactly. Okay, so there's very few things in life that weren't being unhappy. So we're going to go death, divorce, and of course, <laughs> Husky's winning the Apple Cup. Exactly. But 99.9% .9 of life is way more manageable. And it lands somewhere in the middle of this seesaw. And the more we can use our happiness skills, as I'll call them tonight, our happiness skills to move the balance point to the left, the happier we'll be, or the more joy and contentment we'll have. So in sharing my own personal story and my continuous quest for happiness, my hope is that you'll be curious enough to think about happiness as a skill. All right, so there's me. And I was born in East Wenatchee. I know we have a Wenatchee person here tonight. That was table 19, there it is. And we talked about the East Wenatchee versus Wenatchee. So I was grow born in East Wenatchee. And my, f my father passed away when I was three years old. My mom was 28 years old with three young kids. My sister, Terry, was seven. My brother, Mark, was six. And despite all the odds, my kids had a laugh at this picture. Despite all the odds, my mom did a phenomenal job because she raised three kooks. <laughs> Ready? Go kooks. All right. So I met my future wife, Gretchen. <laughs> Still have the mullet, apparently. When I was 17 years old, she also graduated from WSU in the, with a pharmacy degree. After high school, I set my sights on the Palutes. Lived all four years at Theta Chi fraternity. I spent a lot of time at the Coug, maybe too much time. Played baseball my freshman year. And I spent a lot of hours in this building because that's where the Honors College was at the time, in the Honors Library. I graduated in finance and accounting in 1993. 
And I, I heard the bells still ring, which is awesome. We used to walk around campus and go, ah, oh, I love those bells. And did I sp mention I spent a lot of time at the Coug? <laughs> okay, after college, I spent six years at a big four accounting firm. When we left the accounting firm, I started Brighton Jones with my business partner, Charles Brighton. And Charles and I thought that there was a better way, I'm not gonna move, because I think if I move, this thing's gonna give me feedback, uh, that there was a better way to provide personal financial advice to individuals. So we pioneered the concept of playing the role of a personal chief financial officer for high net worth individuals and families. Four years ago, Gretchen and I decided to take a gap year. But instead of being 22 years old, we were 22 years into our career. Our oldest, David, was 14 years old. Molly was 13. Maggie was nine and Vivian was six. So we wanted to experience travel with our kids. And not like vacation travel, but real travel. Things like grocery shop together, cook together, clean together, kind of travel around cities together all day. I mean, imagine spending 24 hours a day for 365 days together. <laughs> we had some trying times, but it was awesome. So all told, we visited six continents. We did not make it to Antarctica. We did hit 35 countries, 47 flights, and, 300, and it took us 365 days to make it all the way around the world. So I could go on all day telling stories about the trip that we took, but I promised that I'd keep it to 15 minutes. <laughs> but there's a couple really important stories on the trip that helped me put, helped put me on a path to thinking about happiness as a skill. So one of the cities we traveled to was Chiang Mai. It's a city in northern Thailand. And our guide's name was Gol, G-O-L, Gol. And Gol spent the last 13 years as a Buddhist monk. And so we didn't spend a lot of time with Gol, but that afternoon that we did spend with him has lasted with me, and it will last with, for me, with me forever. So I asked Gol what it was like to be a Buddhist monk. And he said it was awesome. He could spend all day working on himself. He would meditate for seven hours a day. He'd work out two to three hours a day. And he said that it was the way that he could find inner peace. And I thought to myself, hmm, I've never really thought about that. He said for him to be happy or healthy, he needed to do three things. He needed to eat right, which made sense to me. He needed to work out, also made sense, and then meditate, which I had never thought about. So he said, how do, you, how do you get by without meditating? Don't you want more of everything? Kind of more time, more money, bigger, bigger car, nicer house? Just generally discontent? Meditation, he explained, for him was the key for him to feel like he had just enough of everything, combat, combating the daily temptations of always wanting more. So this really got me thinking about the idea of just enough and wondering about the benefits of meditation and why working out my brain might be just as important as eating right and exercising. So another significant day on the trip was at Manly Beach, Australia. It's a beautiful picture. So we woke up from our apartment right on the beach. Gretchen and I walked to coffee, and we watched families show up, one after another, to go out for their morning surf. So they'd go surfing before their school, before work. I think our biggest stress for the day was whether we could wear our rollerblades on the ferry over to Sydney. No stresses from work, it was a great day. Well, the next day was the exact same as the day before. But for some reason, I felt more like this, right? You know, we have those days where we wake up and just feel like we're in a funk. I was just kind of grumpy and it didn't make sense to me. Everything was the same as the day before, yet I woke up and I was in a bad mood. 
So I thought to myself, hmm, this isn't fair. I should have a little bit more control over my moods. So I talked my kids into trying an experiment with me. So as we walked to the ferry that day, we decided to smile as big as we can at everybody we walked by. So it looked something like this. <laughs> so let's try it. Look at the person next to you, just for a second. Look at the person, Dean, you can look at me. Raise your eyebrows and put a big smile on. See, it just kind of lifts you up a little bit. So the next time you wake up, try it. In a bad mood. So meeting goal and the idea of working out your brain, just like you would your body, and tricking your brain by putting a smile on your face. Put, it, put me on a quest to learn more about the brain and the science of happiness. So back to the question again. What does drive happiness? Well, it took me 47 years, a trip around the world, hiring a director of compassion and, and a chief compassion officer in our dog to answer the question. And we've concluded that's emotional intelligence. So emotional intelligence means being aware of our feelings and managing our feelings in a thoughtful way. It also means paying attention to other people's feelings and being compassionate. So regardless of how much money you have, emotional intelligence is absolutely the foundation for happiness. Let me explain emotional intelligence further. It's basically four things. So one, self-awareness. It's being aware of all your thoughts and emotions, kind of feeling all your feelings, and the ability to manage yourself <laughs> around those feelings. But it's also being aware of other people's feelings, or empathy, and the ability to build relationships with others, or being compassionate. So essentially on the right, on the left, sorry, your, your left, there's self-competence and social competence. So the question is, how do you develop these skills? And this is where goals, seven hours of meditation came in. I don't think you have to do it for seven hours. But mindfulness practices, such as meditation, result in a higher EQ or emotional intelligence. And mindfulness practices are also activities like playing chess, doing artwork, yoga, basically any activity that can help slow down your brain, have singular focus, and allow you to be more present. So in other words, it keeps you from reacting emotionally to life events as they hit the seesaw and allows you to respond more rationally, like this. So what's the science behind this? So I should apologize in advance to my overly simplistic brain slides. I realized tonight <laughs> that I have a neuroscientist in the room, a professor of psychology, lots of them, probably lots of pre-med students as well, that I may offend with my slides, so bear with me. I did say that I was finance and accounting. <laughs> Sue will like these. Chip will like these slides. Okay, so here's the first one. <laughs> Our brains evolved to keep us alive, not happy. So our brains keep us unhappy in two ways. First, goal was right. We're never satisfied. Our natural tendency is to be discontent and want more. Want more of everything. And from an evolutionary perspective, this makes sense. If we were content, we would stop looking for food and ways to pa pass along our genes, which is not a great recipe for success as a species. And second, our brains evolved to focus on risks. We tend to think about the downside and the worst case scenario. 
And that's how we evolved as humans. If we didn't worry about the risk, we likely wouldn't have survived. We probably would have been eaten by saber-toothed tigers. <laughs> so why do we always want more and think about the risks? Well, it's the way that we're hardwired. You see, our emotions and feelings and thoughts all enter our brain through our spinal cord, right into the limbic system. And our limbic brain is where we react emotionally. It's our primal brain that's driven by two things, fear and greed. It keeps us wanting more of everything and overly concerned about what might go wrong. Now, we probably need this, needed this 200,000 years ago for survival, but in modern society, where emails and texts pose no existential risk and junk food is plentiful, we can't rely on our primal brain. And this is where our prefrontal cortex comes in. Again, simple. <laughs> our prefrontal cortex allows us to think rationally versus, re versus react emotionally. And that's the good news. But here's the bad news, is it doesn't happen automatically. It takes work. You see, our rational brain needs strong connections to our emotional brain to override our more primal instincts. But here's the secret. We can accelerate access to this part of our brain by working on mindfulness practices. And that's why happiness is a skill. No different than learning how to play a sport, learning a foreign language, or learning how to play a musical instrument. <laughs> the more intentional we are with mindfulness practices, the happier we'll be. So to sum it up, we all want to be happy. And emotional intelligence helps manage all of life's events. By moving the balance point to the left, and tilting our perspective on life towards more happiness or more joy and contentment. And what's more is that people with higher emotional intelligence tend to be more successful in the workplace, tend to earn more money, and perform better as leaders. Okay, so graduates, you spent 22 years working on your IQ. So congratulations, that's awesome. We're heading on to the future. But here's the deal. My challenge for you is to spend the next 70 plus years working intentionally around your emotional intelligence. And don't take my word for it. Be curious. Explore mindfulness and emotional intelligence and think of happiness as a skill. Thank you. And now, are you ready for your final exam? Here we go. Awesome.